Well, his mom died when he was just seven years old. Uh, It was a time of history where a lot of people tended to die when they were rather young, and John uh, had to deal with overcoming that obstacle. Uh, At the age of 11, John ended up joining his father, who was a sea merchant captain, uh, on the sailing boats. And so he went and joined the first of six different voyages he went with his father. Uh, John quickly learned what it took to be a sailor, the uh, tough and hard, long days uh, where he grew uh, in stature and, and, and strength as he was able to climb the riggings and tie off the ropes. Uh, But after the end of the sixth voyage, John's father decided to retire. And his father decided that the best thing for John was not to be a sailor, but rather to work in an office. Uh, John's father wanted better things for him than to be what he was uh, as he had grown older. Uh, Unfortunately, John was not an office type of person. Uh, John quickly lost his job, and the reason that he said that he lost his job was because of unsettled behavior and uh, impatient restraint. Uh, John was just not able to stay there. And so he uh, was fired, and he left, and he joined another ship that was traveling the seas. Uh, And as he was doing that, uh, a British Navy ship captured the ship that John was on and press gained a number of the crew into service, uh, including John himself. Uh, But John was was arrogant. Uh, John was not a guy that was going to listen to authority. Uh, And he was so impatient that rather than wait out uh, the term of his uh, indentured servanthood, John decided that he would desert And so he deserted and he left the Navy, uh, but he was caught and he was brought back on board and he was stripped in front of his crewmates. He was whipped and he was stripped of rank. But this didn't sit well with John. It didn't make him happy. It didn't make him compliant. And so John began to think of ways that he could kill his officers or he could kill himself or he could get off the ship. And through his insubordination, he eventually convinced his captains that the best thing for them to do would be to discharge him and onto another ship. Uh, John ended up on a slave ship. And for the next 10 years, John traveled on various slave ships selling slaves. Uh, John uh, continued his moral abandonment, as he says, uh, and he uh, eventually was kicked off that slave ship uh, at the first port that they got to. West Africa, and he was placed under the authority of a slaver uh, who was in charge there. But John's uh, actions was such that even the slaver did not like him, and he eventually treated John no better than the slaves that he owned. John eventually got passage back to England on a ship, and as he was traveling there, coming closer to the homeland, uh, he uh, was sleeping one night when a storm hit. And a hole happened to come into the side of the ship and it started to fill up with water and John woke up to water filling his cabin. And in that moment, John decided to cry out to God and he said, God, save me. At that moment, the cargo in the ship shifted to where it blocked the hole and did not allow uh, water to keep coming in and they were able to make it safely to harbor. But even though John knew and felt that God had saved him, John still lived how he wanted to live. Uh, After six more years of becoming uh, his own captain on his own slave ship, John decided to retire. Uh, He became a tax collector, which isn't that much better, right? And he started collecting taxes from the various regions. And as he did that, he decided, I need to start to read my Bible. And he joined Bible studies and he started to teach his own Bible studies and he studied Greek and he studied Hebrew and he studied uh, Syriac. And as he was doing all these things, he decided that the best thing for him would be to go into ministry. And eventually he was ordained as a priest in the Church of England. Uh, One of the most notable things that John did is that he wrote a pamphlet 38 years after he had retired detailing the horrific conditions that were on the slave ships for the slaves. And he wrote it and he apologized for his own involvement in it and also that it took so long for him to confess this major sin in his life. John became a 
primary voice for the abolitionist movement in England. And because of his pamphlet and because of his influence, he eventually uh, convinced uh, the parliament in in, uh, England to ban slavery. John's life was radically different as an adult, as an elderly man, than it was as a teenager. And if you were to look at the elder John, you would never guess that in his past he was this moral, abandoned child. And if you were to look at the teenage John, you would never think that he would live long enough to be what he became. God had transformed John's life. Our God is a God who transforms imperfect lives to reflect His perfect person. And our God wants to transform our lives even to this day. Uh, There are countless people in churches sitting here on Sunday morning who have been transformed by God that the person that they are now is not the person that they used to be. Our God desires to see transformation happen. We've been studying the life of Jacob here in our series that we've entitled Perfectly Imperfect. And in this study, we've seen how imperfect Jacob is. Uh, Jacob deceived his brother into getting the inheritance. He deceived his father into getting the blessing of God. He deceived Laban as he left. Jacob's life has been one of deception, and Jacob has had faults every step of the way. And if we were to ask the question, who is Jacob? The simple answer is Jacob is egotistical. He is all about himself. He is not worried about how his actions affect other people. He's not worried about the pain that he causes and the way that he treats them. He is only worried about one person, and that is himself. And yet, despite this, God has been with Jacob every step of the way. But now Jacob is coming back home. He is coming to probably the most challenging situation that he has had to face in his life. He is going to have to face his brother Esau. And so we're going to read about Jacob's encounter today with Esau and how God transforms people into new people. Uh, If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 32 today, starting in verse 3 and 5 through 5. Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 3, and here's what it says. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he instructed them, this is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and I have donkeys and sheep and goats, uh, male and female servants. And now I am sending this message to my lord that I might find favor in your eyes. See, Jacob is returning. He knows that God has told him, come back home, that I will take care of you. But there's still uncertainty in Jacob's life. Uh, The last time he was here, Jacob did not end on a good note with Esau. In fact, Esau said, the moment that our father dies, I'm going to kill you. And so Rebekah, their mother, loved Jacob enough that she didn't want him to die. So she said, leave, go. And I will tell you, I will send word when your brother's temper is done. Well, that word has never come. And so as far as Jacob knows, Esau's still pretty mad at him. Esau still wants him dead. And so he's kind of uncertain as to what is going to happen. And, and, and so he kind of decides to send uh, a messenger. He's scheming on how he can handle his brother. And so he sends the messenger, go talk to him and kind of get a feel. Feel out where Esau is. It's interesting the message that Jacob gives. Uh, It seems like Esau doesn't really know that Jacob has been with Laban. Uh, Maybe all that Rebekah and Isaac told Esau was that Jacob has gone to find a wife elsewhere. Uh, Esau has not seen his brother or heard from his brother for 20 years. And so this messenger would probably be a shock to Esau. And so the messengers go, and they come back, and they tell Jacob this in verse 6. When the messengers returned, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, him and 400 other men. 
Now, this is uh, probably 400 fighting men. Uh, Jacob, if we can remember, was leaving the house of Laban, and he did it in a kind of a deceitful way. And, and Laban decided to chase after Jacob. And Laban grabbed all of his relatives, and they went after And We're talking maybe a couple of dozen people. But when they caught up to Jacob, Jacob didn't have the fighting force to combat Laban's few dozen. So imagine what's going through Jacob's head right now. He doesn't have the ability to fight a few dozen. How is he going to stand against 400 men? See, this is not what Jacob was expecting. See, he he had it all planned out. He sends a messenger. The only kind thing would be for Esau to send a messenger back, not for Esau to come himself. And so Jacob enters into panic mode. In verses 7 through 8, we read that in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and herds and camels as well. And he thought, if Esau comes and attacks one group, then the other group that is left may escape. So he enters into panic mode. He's afraid. He knows that this is probably the end of his life. And so he divides up his family. He divides up his possessions. He divides up his servants. And he does that in the hopes that just some of them will be able to escape what is coming. See, God had a promise to Jacob. A promise that when you go back, I am going to take care of you. And yet Jacob is not trusting in that promise. In fact, Jacob is still trying to control things. He's still trying to do everything by his own power and his own might, even sending the messengers to Esau. It was all about Jacob having control. But now things are getting out of control. Now he doesn't have the ability to fight off Esau with 400 men. Now he's having to divide his family. And I can't imagine what that is like. How do you divide up your 12 children? How do you say, okay, you go over there and you go over there. And if you guys die, uh, but, but maybe you guys will live in... I mean, I can't imagine what is going through Jacob. And I think Jacob reaches... A breaking point. And Jacob gets to a place where he realizes that he no longer has control, that he no longer is going to be able to control what is going on or what is happening in his life, and he doesn't see a way out. And so he cries out to God in verse 9. He prays and says, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, You who have said, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness that you have shown your servants. I only had my staff when I crossed the Jordan, but now I've become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau. For I am afraid that he will come and attack me and the mother of my children. But you have said, surely I will make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sea of the sand which cannot be counted. And what's interesting in Jacob's story is this. This is the first time that Jacob prays. See, in every other instance, in every other major moment in Jacob's life, God has come to Jacob. God came before he was born to promise uh, Rebecca what would happen. God came when Jacob was leaving to tell Jacob, Jacob, I am with you. God came to Jacob when he was in the land with Laban saying, it's time for you to go home. God even came at the very beginning of this chapter in verse 1 where we didn't read, as I am the Lord. God has come to Jacob every step of the way, and yet here, finally, at the very end, when he has lost all control, Jacob comes to God. Jacob finally realized that the only way that he was going to live his life and be able to live it well is if he stopped worrying about himself and start relying on the promises of God. See, here's the truth that we see in this story. God transformed Jacob to rely on him. See, our God wants us to rely on Him, and sometimes that takes transformation. Sometimes it takes God taking us where we're at and getting us to a broken place so that we can cry out to Him and rely on Him. 
Too many times in life we try to go through things doing it all by ourselves. We try to control situations, whether it's in our families, whether it's at our works, whether it's in our relationships with other people. And we, like Jacob, we scheme about how we can get ahead. And we worry about just one person ourselves. And we're not worried about how our actions affect other people. And it's when that happens, when we are in control, when we're trying to direct things, that our lives become messes. That our relationship with our boss ends up not being very good. That the friendships that we have made, that they're not necessarily what we want them to be. That our family, not necessarily the family that we live with, but our family beyond that aren't the people that we like to be around, and they don't really like to be around us. It's when we're in those messes, when we're broken, just like Jacob is, that we realize that really God has a better thing for us. And God wants us to rely on Him before we get that broken, before we get into that messy of a situation. Our God wants to transform us to the point where we will rely on Him for everything. And Jacob, he has to learn this. And it takes being broken. It takes this moment where he has no control over Esau coming with 400 men and what is going to happen and all these questions that he has. It takes this moment for God to be first on his mind. Well, he cries out to God and as in every other situation, God will come to Jacob. In verse 22 through 24, we read this. That night Jacob got up, he took his two wives, his two female servants, his eleven sons, and he crossed the fort of the Jabbok. And after he had sent them across the stream, he sent all of his other possessions. And so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Uh, Jacob sends everybody across, and he decides that it's time for me to just kind of be by myself. He needs time to think. He needs time to figure out where God wants him to be. He needs time just to pray and meditate and be in the presence of God. And as he is there, as he is waiting for the day, a man comes. And it's kind of interesting, right? He's just kind of sitting there. I kind of picture him sitting on his rock, looking up to the heavens, wondering what is going on. And a man comes up and attacks him. And they begin to wrestle, and, and I'm not an expert. I, I got told I was wrong last time, and I'm sure, I'm sure I'll get told I'm wrong again. But if you're in high school and you're wrestling, the most amount of time is like six minutes for a match. That's all they wrestle, six minutes, and they get breaks in between. All right? And the reason why is because it's tiring. I mean, if you ever watch these people, they're, they're kind of, unless they're really well-conditioned, and, and it's just a tiring sport. So imagine trying to wrestle all night. It's just a matter of who will give up first, who will outlast the other. And Jacob doesn't even know who this man is. This man, as far as Jacob knows, doesn't know who he is. And they're just wrestling probably for dear life. And in verses 25 through 26, we read that when the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched. It was out of sockets. And as he was wrestled with the man, all this was happening. And then the man said to Jacob, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so we have this scene happening where, where Jacob and this man are wrestling. It gets to the point where no one is going to overpower the other one. And so this man just touches the socket of, of Jacob, the hip. And Jacob's hip goes out of socket and and Jacob is there in pain, wrestling the man, clinging to him, not letting him go. And finally, the man says, you must let me go, for it is daybreak. Now, to this point in the story, we have not been told who this man is. And in fact, we will never be told who this man is. But we do have some hints. One, this man has the power to dislocate somebody's socket's hip without, just by touching and I'm not an expert, I'm not a medical doctor or anything, but it's pretty spectacular that all he does is go like this and it's out of socket. Either he has weak hips or, or something more is going on. Uh, the second thing is he says, I cannot, I must leave by daybreak. And the idea there is that you cannot look upon my face. And in the Old Testament, the only person that was never allowed to be looked upon was God Himself. So who has the power 
to dislocate a hip just by a touch and who cannot be seen. And I think Jacob knows who this man is. Jacob is recognizing what is taking place. And so as the man pleads, let me go, Jacob says, bless me first. Uh, blessings in that time period, it was more than just me saying, I hope things go well for you. It was imparting a part of who you were onto the other person. It's why Isaac's blessing was fought over by Esau and Jacob. It's why Laban chases down his family so that he can bless them. It was highly important in their society. And Jacob recognizes that this man is more powerful than I am, and I want to be blessed by him. And so he says, bless me. And in response, the man says this in verses 27 and 28. He asked Jacob, what is your name? And he answered, Jacob. And then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans, and you have overcome. Uh, names in that time period were often considered things of power. If you gave your name, the other person had power over you, except in the New Old Testament. In the Old Testament, names were different than that. Names were a description of who you are. It was a self-revelation of what your nature was. And so when this man asked, what is your name? He's asking, who are you? On the deepest part of who you are, and on the inside, what is your character? And Jacob replies, I am Jacob, the deceiver. And when we look at Jacob's life, we can say that this is no better name than Jacob. He had deceived his brother into getting the inheritance. He had deceived his father into getting the blessing of God. He had even deceived Laban in the way that he got his sheep. And when it was time to go, rather than settling accounts, he deceived Laban again by leaving early. Every step of the way, Jacob has been a deceiver. And yet this man, this person that's wrestling with Jacob says, no, your name is not Jacob. Your name is Israel. And the name Israel can be read as he who wrestles with God. And the reality is in Jacob's life, it's not that he's been going around deceiving people left and right. The reality is, is that Jacob has been wrestling with the control that God has over his life. See, God had come before Jacob was born and said, hey, the second son, Jacob, he will be the one that gets the inheritance. He will be the one that I use. He will be the one that I bless. And God would have allowed that to happen. God would have worked it out for that to take place. And yet Jacob, in his impatience, and his unwilling to allow God to truly have control over his life, he wrestled with God on this point, and he took matters into his own hands. And he deceived his brother, and he deceived his father, and he wrestled with God's control. When God came to Jacob on his way to uh, Laban, God said, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to give you wives. I'm going to give you children. I'm going to bless you while you were there. And yet Jacob goes there and he doesn't rely on God. And he wrestles with God's control in his life. And he says, I will work for you, Laban, for 14 years. Rather than letting God give me my own wives, I will work for it. And rather than allowing God to give him possessions, he tries to figure out how he can gain more and more by doing various things that don't actually work to get more and more possessions. And when God said, I will take you back and I will protect you, Jacob is still wrestling with God over the protection of his life. And Jacob is saying, no, I have better plans than what you have, God. I'm going to send messengers to Esau. We're going to get things figured out way before I have to meet him face to face. I got this, God. And God says, are you sure? Jacob's life has been a wrestling match. And he has fought with God every step of the way. And God, this man, says to Jacob, no, it's not that you deceive men, it's that you're fighting against God. And when Jacob realizes this, 
He has just one question for the man in verse 29. He says to him, please tell me your name. Who are you? And the man simply answers by saying, why do you ask? You know who I am. And then the man blesses Jacob. And what we see in this story is the second power of God's transformative powers. God transformed Jacob to Israel. It's a minor switch. It's a name change. But in the Old Testament world, it's a matter of changing the character and the nature of the person. And our God, He wants to change us in the same way. He wants to take us from who we are, Jacob, our deceiving selves, all about ourselves, all about focusing on ourselves, and He wants to make us Israel. The reality is is that we wrestle with God over and over and over again in our lives. Uh, Like Jacob, when we try to take things into our own hands, we are wrestling with God. When we are unwilling to trust in God's promises that He's going to provide and take care and going to be in every situation for us and be by our side, we are wrestling with God just like Jacob did. And the beauty thing is is that this name Israel, it can be read forwards as well as backwards. We can read it, He who wrestles with God, or we can read it, God who fights for Him. And we have a God who is trying to get across to us that we don't need to be fighting against Him because God is wanting to fight for us. God is wanting to be on our side. God is wanting to take charge and to fight for our, on our behalf. And if we can stop wrestling against God and relax and relent to Him, then God will be fighting on our side. And He will get us through those situations. And He will get us through those messes that we have made. And He will provide and He will protect and He will be with us. And our lives may not always be peachy, but God will be there getting us through. Well, God leaves Jacob. Uh, Esau is still concerned. The next morning, it's morning Esau is about to show up and Jacob now has to face him. In chapter 33, starting in verses 1 through 3, we read these words. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. And so he divided his children among Leah, Rachel, and his two female servants. And he put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. And then he himself went on ahead, and he bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. So God has said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to make you prosper. And Jacob now realizes, okay, he's going to do this. But this is still a scary moment. It's one thing to hear that 400 men are coming. It's a completely different thing to see them on the horizon. And so Jacob in this moment decides to order his family in order of importance. Notice that, that Rachel, the woman that he loves the most, she is in the back, followed by his next wife, Leah, followed by these two handmaidens. And he goes in front of them as the leader, And I think his hope is that if Esau attacks, I will die first, but my family, they will get away. And in importance, hopefully the most important, get away first. And he bows down as a sign of respect, showing Esau that he is master. And then Esau does this in verse 4. Esau ran to meet Jacob, and he embraced him. And he threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him and they wept together. It's kind of an anticlimactic end to this story. Jacob is expecting a fight. Jacob is expecting to die. Jacob's expecting for his people to die as well. Esau has 400 men. Why did he bring 400 men? Why did Esau go through all, or Jacob go all through these schemes only to have Esau embrace him, kiss him? And weep. It's a major shift in the story. It's a change in what is going on. And it's only after composing himself that Esau finally looks up and he sees everyone else. In verses 5 through 7, uh, we're told this uh, that uh, the, Esau looked up, he saw the women and children, and he asked Jacob, Who are these with you? 
And Jacob answered, They are the children God has graciously given your servant. And then the female servants and their children approached, and they bowed down. And next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. And last of all, Joseph and Rachel, they too bowed down. This is the first time Esau gets to meet his sister-in-laws and his uh, niece and nephews. And so he's kind of shocked. He, does, he hasn't heard for 20 years. He doesn't even know that Jacob has that many uh, family members. And so he is, he, he's surprised and shocked. Who are these? And then as they come before Jacob or Esau, they again show the respect that they have for Esau by bowing down in front of him. And then Esau remembers something else. In verses 8 through 9, uh, we're told that Esau said, What was the meaning of the flocks that I passed? You know, I was on my way to meet you. Why were they passing me? And Jacob said, To find favor in your eyes, my Lord. And Esau said, I already have plenty, brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Uh, in this time period, to give animals away was a sign that you were aware of your guilt that you were conscious of it, and that you were seeking forgiveness. And so for Jacob to send all of these flocks of sheep and goats and animals to Esau, is Jacob saying, this is how guilty I am. I know that I, what I did in the past was wrong, and I am sorry. And Esau recognizes that too and says, no, no, no. They're yours. And eventually Esau accepts it, and Esau, by accepting them, forgives his brother and is reconciled to him on this day. And what we see in God's transformative power is this, is that God transformed Esau from anger to forgiveness. See, while Jacob was wrestling with God throughout his entire life, for the last 20 years, Esau has been wrestling with God as well. I mean, Esau has had 20 years to think about what Jacob has done. He's had 20 years to consider why Jacob would treat him this way. And one thing that I found in my life is the more time I have to think on a situation where I have been wrong, I come to realize the areas that I have wronged those other people. And Esau realizes maybe I haven't treated Jacob correctly. In any situation, almost every situation, there are two parties that are at wrong. And Esau has come to realize this, and when he sees his brother for the first time in 20 years, all he has is love for him. And he loves Jacob enough to forgive. In our lives, as we wrestle with God, there are other people who are wrestling with God as well. And the broken relationships we have, they can be mended because God is not only working on us, God is working on other people as well. Our God transforms imperfect lives to reflect his perfect person. And in the story of Jacob and in the story of Esau, we see God working to bring about them and their imperfect lives and all the mess that they have made to make them more like him. Our God wants to transform us. He wants to make us Look like Him. And as we wrestle with God, we have to come to the realization that we will never win that fight. As we wrestle with God's promises in our lives, we must come to the realization that we will never take control, that in the end, God has the ultimate control. And as we're fighting with God, we'll find that we end up fighting against the world, and we cannot take on the world by ourselves. We will not win in this world if all we are doing is trying to control everything that is happening. We have to surrender to God. And we have to allow Him to transform us. In Romans chapter 2, ver 12, verse 2, we read this, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to attest to and approve what God's will is, the good and pleasing and perfect will. See, as we fight with God and as we try to control the world, what ends up happening more often than not is we become like the world and we begin to think like the world and we act like the world. I mean, that's what's happened in Jacob's life. Uh, rather than trusting in God, rather than saying, God, you got this, Jacob has tried to take control. And as a result, Jacob has acted just like everyone else was acting in that time. He was focused on himself and how he could further his cause and how he could be number one in this world. 
And it's only by surrendering to God is He allowing God to take control. In our lives, we cannot look like the rest of the world. We must surrender to God and be transformed. And it begins with the way we think. It begins with recognizing that God is truly the one that is in control. And as we submit to God, God begins to change us. And we get to begin to see God for who He is face to face. Jacob in this story is not allowed the ability to see God for who He is. But in the New Testament, we are told that if we are in Christ and that we are following Him and we are surrendering ourselves to Him, then we get to see God face to face. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians these words. He says, And we who with unveiled faces contemplate, look upon the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is Spirit. And what Paul says here is as we surrender to God, we get to look on God face to face. And as we look upon God, we begin to reflect God's glory. And eventually, we are transformed into the image of God Himself. This is what God wants from us. Not only does God want to transform us from our imperfect lives, it's more than that. He wants to transform us to make us reflect Him. To look like Him. I mean, this is the goal of what we are doing here. The more we surrender to God, the more we allow God to transform us, the more we begin to look like who God is. And eventually we get this in Romans 8, 29. We have a God who foreknew and He predestined so that they may be conformed into the image of Jesus. And the more we allow God to transform our lives, the more people will begin to look at us and they'll mistake us, not Tony, not for Kevin, not for Ben, They'll look at us and they will see Jesus. And that's what I desire. And that's my desire for you as well, is that people will mistake you for Jesus because you have surrendered your lives. And that you've stopped wrestling with God and that you've allowed Him to transform you into the image of His Son. Our God transformed perfect people to make them reflect the image of Jesus. Stop wrestling with God. Stop fighting against His plans for your lives. And be transformed. Let me pray for you. God, we're grateful that You are a transformative God. That You take us where we were You make us into something beautiful. God, I'm grateful that you've moved me from who I was as a teenager, who I was as a younger person, to who I am now. And I can't wait for to reflect you more and more in my life. I pray for everyone here that that is the desire we all have. To be mistaken for you. Because we reflect your glory. Thank you for Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen.